Hey y'all, producer Levi here, just dropping a quick note at the front of this episode to let you know that this was recorded way back at the end of January, before the coronavirus had really spread and before COVID-19 had sort of come into the U.S. and really upheaved everything. So we are not making light amidst that situation. It's just not being talked about because it hadn't gotten here yet. Thanks for listening. And now... Here's the episode. I'm Alfonso Winker. And I'm Trina Olson. And together, we're the co-founders of Team Dynamics. And this is Behave. Welcome back. We are so excited to have our listeners tuning in for a conversation that we've been asked to have for a while from folks who really have a strong desire to do meaningful and impactful diversity, equity, inclusion, race, gender focused change work. So when we think about organizational change, when we think about organizational culture, when we think about patterns of being at work in America and its colonies, One of the things that we get reached out to at Team Dynamics the most about is something along these lines. We were making some progress and then got stuck. I have all that data, but for some reason there's still resistance. I think we could make this policy change pretty quick, but at the board meeting it got voted down. So folks are running into barriers that are perceived or real. Sometimes it feels like a particular argument or a particular person is standing in the way of moving some equity justice goals forward. And so for all of us who care about leveling the playing field in the workplace and making sure we can actually access the very best talent, start utilizing our differences as assets, and really tap into the kind of creativity and innovation that is required in our roles, Sometimes we have to push through a couple barriers. I'm curious, Alfonso, what are some barriers that you have heard or you have experienced personally when you as a champion for change are making an offering? Like, hey, I have an idea. We could do this better or different. Or I learned about how to do this more inclusively. What have you ever run up against that might help our listeners as they're thinking about having to make the case for forward movement? So I think about it in three sort of messages. Okay. Like I think about, I don't think of specific characters or roles, but I think of three things that we can hear different flavors of. So the first that we might hear, and they're not necessarily in order of frequency or importance, but one of the first things we might hear is about it, about equity work being someone else's problem. Mm. So it might be white folks or men or straight people saying something like women or people of color or LGBTQ people are just causing a problem or causing a disturbance. So it's sort of like they are causing a problem. Mm. So if they just like did things our way. So there's this thing where dominant culture might feel like other people just need to be more like them. Right. And as a reminder, dominant culture in this context means this culture was created by people like me, by me, for me, with me in mind. Yeah. The next thing we might hear is things are working. And that's often true. You are making the thing you make, producing the art or the content that you produce, running the programs that you run, selling the products that you sell. It's happening. But we might be missing something about the experience of certain kinds of people across lines of race or gender in our workplace or the experience of our user, our consumer, or the community that we work with. So we might be saying, things are really working, and I don't, why, why would we get into this, things are working? And then the third thing that we hear a lot is that the issues are too big, that it's for some other entity or group of people, that the enormity of social problems isn't for our team or for me to take up, that's for someplace else or somebody else. So it's mm. we go from those people are the problem to, well, things are working, but probably folks are missing that there's some nuanced experience to the issues too big. Like those are sort of the f- 
flavors of phrases we hear when there is resistance. Yeah, and I think you're right. Those They come out in a bunch of different ways. And so often with that third one you were talking about, this is just too big to get into, we hear time and money as the reason or excuse, right? We don't have time for that. We have really big goals this quarter or we hadn't budgeted for that, right? And at some point, some of us have got to stop and actually build equity into our plan or we're going to keep perpetuating behavior and outcomes that are so wildly outside of our values, we're not going to be able to feel good about coming to work. So tell me what you do when we start hearing that finger pointing piece, the surely this is somebody else's problem or they're the ones causing the problem. We hear this in coded ways a lot, like that person's not a good fit or that's just how our organizational culture is. For folks, because this is an audio medium, you didn't see, I was like shaking really my head faces. when I was like, this isn't for you. But we hear that a lot and people believe it when they're saying it, right? They believe that other people are being disruptive by needing something different or by asking a question or some of us are treated as disruptors when we are simply describing what's going to allow us to do our best work or when we know you had really positive intent, but the impact really sucked for me. Right. And so even if we are trying to be proactive and constructive, that idea of surely this could be handled better if everybody just quieted down, put their head down and got to work. Yeah. Well, for me, when I, when I hear fear or anger, and that's mm. usually what's coming out is we have to remember that folks are anger might be coming or fear might be coming from a place of a belief that if we were to change something, I might lose something. Yeah. So the thing that is really hard to do is to engage with someone and really ask what they value. Yeah. So rather than making the case for the change more, the, the person is angry about the potential for change or afraid of the potential for change. So we have to get behind that fear and behind that anger and really get curious about what values might be driving them. And try to connect a dot between the values that are driving our internal equity work with the values that that person has. Yeah, and it's interesting here to get creative because when we think about that fear and anger, we also we often think about the desire to protect or defend. And I think you do a really great job of asking what's essential, right? And so a good example maybe from just the last couple months with you and I is we were starting to have conversations about who needed to be in what meetings. Right. And one of the things we decided is that I should come out of three of our regular meetings. And so I felt that urge to be like, but like, will my vantage point be included if I'm not there? Like, will I see the notes from the meeting? Can I contribute to the agenda? And so the idea that like we're going to make a change because we had a goal. There's a really important way I need to be spending my time and I'm not needed in that meeting. And so it's this idea of how can I be the best contributor to my company, given my role, my identity, my expertise, my knowledge, my skill set, and letting that be an alive conversation. I think too much at work is set it and forget it. This is the rule. This is how it should be. And I think this idea of fear of something becoming different I just refuse to buy in when folks say, well, you know, Trina, people just don't like change. Some people don't like change. (laughs) I love change. As you know, I've lived in 18 cities and I think I'm now in my 27th place dwelling, place of living. I like moving a lot. That might make me different, but that idea that all people feel resistant to change just isn't true. But change kicking up something physically in people of, I don't want it. I think we really have to check in with ourselves. Why don't we want it? And that not wanting change, I think, gets me to that place of, well, things are working. So folks are experiencing comfort. Mm -hmm. So if the resistance is coming in the form of, well, what would we change? Things are really working for you. Things are working for you. So the invitation, folks are not going to be surprised, is self-awareness work. Mm -hmm. What about working here or working on this team or being a part of this organization is comfortable for you? And could you imagine that comfort looks different for other people? And oftentimes when folks are saying, I don't think there's a problem here. Things are really working. It's coming from an earnest place. Yeah. We might hear that they're entirely opposed to our body of equity work when, in fact, they probably could believe that some of their peers are having a different experience if they were invited to slow down a little bit and think about their own and say, yeah, actually, I was here when the company was founded. I've worked here my entire career. 
I've worked primarily with peers that share my age, my race, my gender. Oh, yeah, there's a lot that's really working for me. Right. I wonder if, like, to get to that, yeah. I wonder if other people are experiencing some level of discomfort and might want things to look different. And I think those two words are the difference that makes the difference, right, for me. You and I were working with a client recently and talking about equity in dress codes. And so the way we like to start having that conversation is everybody actually saying for themselves, here's a dress code that would work for me. And that's when you discover that some people are really – it's working to say we expect your dress to be semi-formal when clients are in the building or when we host an evening event. And we might discover that uh, along lines of class, race, age, region where we grew up, gender identity, it's causing me a lot of stress. And for you, it's feeling easy peasy, right? And so this idea that like, what would work best for you? So sometimes it's that invitation to not think so broadly, but to actually think really specifically. So what would work for everybody? Boy, I don't know, because I'm not in, I'm not with them in the morning when they're getting dressed right. or they're going shopping. But if I can actually think, what would help me do more work? You even had a conversation with clients that were thinking about working really long hours and how uncomfortable some shoes were. And the fact that if the expectation is I'm going to wear shoes that hurt for more than eight hours. I'm not going to be able to pay attention to the meeting anymore. Right. <laughs> right? So again, back to our goals. How do we think about uh, asking that question? Who is this working for? Are there some people for whom this might not be working? And boy, we're smart adults. I bet we can come up with a creative solution where this works better for more people. So you and I's shorthand for that is, I bet there are some better best practices. Yeah. And you were inviting folks to get really specific, which feels like the antidote to that getting stuck approach. Yeah. When folks are saying, oh, but like injustice is so big and who are we and maybe we shouldn't and are we the right ones or like our mix isn't exactly right or like the problems are so big and we're just a team of blah or like we're part of this bigger industry. Right. Or isn't the next generation just going to fix it? Right. So when folks are sort of captured in that bigness of a problem, specificity really helps. Mm -hmm. So it's not that people don't even believe there's a problem. They've moved out of comfort to say like. Yeah, I can see there's comfort and discomfort. I can see there's equity and inequity in different pockets. I'm aware that people across race and gender and sexuality, et cetera, are having different experiences here in this workplace. Mm -hmm. The problem doesn't seem like ours to fix. It seems like someone else's to fix. That's society or what have you. And so I think the question for that message is that's so great that you're aware of it. The work in front of us is to ask tomorrow, what singular thing could we do differently and then each day think about a different practice or specific thing or each month what singular thing could we zoom in on to slowly undo the ways that we're just going with the flow if we think like society's like a river right and yeah. like the river is just flowing and what, creating inequities right yeah what one thing could we do today to sort of course correct or or turn that current just a little bit so that we're making smaller corrections that add up more and more. Yeah. And you and I have said that empowered approach is what makes this work really doable day to day because we think what's in our control? What could I do more of, less of differently? Is there a way that I can move from not knowing, making assumptions, wondering to having more information, to knowing, to trying something out? And I think when folks get into that too big, we don't have time, we don't have money, we will always kindly say, You have to choose to make time and you have to choose to make an investment. And what we don't want is folks coming back year after year after year saying equity is a goal and saying they're so frustrated that they haven't made any progress, right? Saying we keep saying this is a goal. We keep saying diversification is a goal. At some point, you got to back it up. And so I love that idea of not taking really big gulps of water, but sips. What is that one or two things I could do just in my role with the tasks in front of me? with my team, with the broader company, and then within the sector. So it's it's helpful sometimes to think about actions in those multiple influence points. When we come back from our break, I want to talk about whether or not folks should even be putting attention or energy into the people that they think are the roadblocks to the work. Mm, sounds great. Rung-a-gung-go, 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 rung-a-gung-go
Welcome back. We'd like to close out today's episode by digging in on where you should put your time and attention when you're hearing a lot of pushback. And so Alfonso and I both have actually a lot of campaign experience, and we learned a lot about how we target or talk to particular voters, about when it's time to do persuasion work, about who really are our decision makers. And those feel like some transferable skills when we think about where are we going to put our time and energy on a given day when we are hearing somebody sort of put their hands up and say, I don't want to do it. So what's your advice for our listeners? So I think a lot about loud voices Mm. versus essential authorizers. You're absolutely going to hear from people that are a part of your team about their challenges, their issues with, their pushback around the fact that the organization is engaging in transformational work. Transformational work can feel scary. It can feel really far away. It can feel uncomfortable. All of those things are signs that an organization is changing. It's important to listen for, are they coming from that fear and anger place? So find out what they value. What thing do they feel like they're losing? Are they coming from that... I'm comfortable and things are working place. And so do you need to talk to them about, have you paused to consider your comfort? Are they coming from that? It's too big. Why are we taking this up place and help them get really specific? So that's about sort of general people who might have a loud voice or a challenge to something. But ask yourself, is this singular person or small group of people actually getting in the way? So folks might characterize pushback from a couple of people as a roadblock. Is it actually a roadblock or is it just hard for you as a champion to hear that not everybody's as enthusiastic about the work as you are? It means you just might be farther along in your journey than they are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you better and it doesn't mean they're a permanent roadblock. In the other hand, there might be some essential authorizers who actually are in charge of organizational strategy, budget, or make the call whether or not to have folks get in a room, participate in training and coaching and learning and development together. Then you have to ask yourself, who are the messengers that these folks might hear from? So as a champion, you have to have enough humility to understand that you may not always be the right messenger. Right. You may need to send surrogates in for yourself to really make the case depending on what's going on. So if someone can't hear it from you, that absolutely has to do with what your current patterns are about whose voice gets to influence strategy. Right. And I would say when you hold really tightly to your goals and sort of more lightly to how you get there, I think you're going to find all sort of exciting champions and comrades along the way because we can't predict who is going to be excited and who's going to really push back. And I also think remembering that in different cultural traditions and communities, wrestling, arguing, calling into question some chains of logic or some data is how people are taught, right? We have friends who have taught us that wrestling with their rabbi is a way that you engage in your faith for some folks in the Jewish tradition, right? Or we know a lot of cultural communities that are external communicators, evocative and emotional speakers. And so that idea that sometimes we decide that because somebody is communicating in a certain way that it means they don't share goals, it just might be how they get there. And so I really resonate with what you said around how it can hurt our hearts when we wish everybody was cheerleading alongside us. It can feel isolating. It can feel alone. It's part of why we're really excited to have this community of listeners because we know that people throughout The country and the globe are working day in and day out in their nine to five, in their five to nine, in whatever their their job, their role is to say, hey, this could be better and different, right? The inequities don't feel right to me. Something feels off. Some of my friends are being left out. I'm feeling like I don't get to use my whole voice. And so part of what we remind people to do is stay focused on your goals. Don't let somebody yank you away from your strategy and your plan or take up a ton of your time because they are trying to sink the equity ship, right? It's just, it's reactivity to an evolution, right? And so I appreciate that we wanted to bring this topic today because it's not going to be all smooth sailing. So don't expect that it will be but you will find the people you need to help you move the goals forward. We're curious, how are you wrestling with roadblocks, pushback, folks that maybe are reticent to engage in your internal transformation work? Send us a tweet on our Behave Twitter, which I don't know if we've talked about here on the podcast before, at Behave Podcast. Send us a tweet. Let us know how you are 
moving through roadblocks and tackling tough questions along the way. Thanks for hanging out today. Make good choices. Behave is produced by Levi Weinhagen in Studio G at the Glenn Nelson Center.